bringing you key insights, tips, and advice from the brightest minds of the Canadian franchise industry. This is the Franchise Canada's Experts Podcast. Welcome to the Franchise Canada's Experts Podcast. I'm your co-host, Trisha Tomey. And I'm Andrew Shaw, editor of Franchise Canada Magazine. And thank you for tuning in to the very first episode. It's going to be a really good one because today's guest has a ton of information about one of the biggest industries in franchising right now, health and fitness. Yeah, Trisha. And according to one of the franchisors we featured in the January-February issue of the magazine, it's a roughly $32 billion industry. And by the way, you can find the magazine at bookstores and newsstands across Canada and at franchisecanada.cfa.ca. And there's no better person to speak about the health and fitness industry than Steve Platt. He is the co-owner and co-founder of Third Degree Training, arguably one of the fastest growing companies in Atlanta, Canada. And he's known for motivating and empowering hundreds of businesses and individuals to live healthier and more active lives. During our chat with him, we dove deep into topics like the top qualities he looks for in a franchisee, why the health and fitness category has been experiencing such significant growth over the past five years, how to set and reach big business goals, and Steve's number one piece of advice for anyone looking to become a business owner, and so, so much more. So without further ado, here's a chat with Steve Collette. Let's just dive right in. Can you tell us about your background before you became co-owner of Third Degree Training? Well, I, I bounced around from all sorts of things. I guess I was trying to find my own. Like, like a lot of entrepreneurs that, that I've discovered later on in my career by, by networking with, I had a lot of similar characteristics of, of, of those where I tried a little bit of everything. And the one thing that, that uh, always found true is you kind of got to go with your gut. So I had literally, I've done everything from retail to food to fire and safety, to construction, to uh, oil field work, to everything you can think of. And then it was, it was, uh, that's, my background is, is a, a, a lot of everything. <laughs> wow. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And so how did you kind of decide to go with, like, being an entrepreneur? How did you? Well, it, it, it's funny, because that's a really hard question to, to answer. And the, the thing is, you know, if, if you ask me that I always know I wanted to be an entrepreneur, I always had the characteristics, and I always, you know, I always, I always had those qualities. I, I really, I wasn't aware of it at the time. I guess um, I really like to be really good at anything that I that I that I did. Um, as an entrepreneur, what motivated me to to get into entrepreneurship wasn't so much the quote unquote be my own boss. It was to be able to always create, to be able to lead. And to put passion that I have into pretty much everything that I do into uh, doing that for a living. So, you know, I mean, it, it, it's one of these things where I, I'm sure that most entrepreneurs out there or most people that are looking to become an entrepreneur can probably relate to that. And uh, we always say as entrepreneurs, is, I think we're legally insane. <laughs> you know? And it's just kind of coming to terms with that and finding that balance. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, that, I hope that answers the question. Yeah, no, for sure. And, uh, you know, I was watching a lot of your videos, actually, on YouTube, because I know you're a motivational speaker. One of the things you mentioned was that you were homeless at one point in your life. So I was interested in, in understanding, you know, how did you go from being homeless to where you are today as well? No, that's a good question. It, it, you know, it, it's one of these things I don't, I don't talk about a whole lot. I certainly don't have any problem talking about it. And then I never try to use it as a sales pitch to basically say, this is where I'm at, or this is where I was, and this is where I am now. When I was, went through that really rough time, it was not by accident. It was no one else's fault. It was sheerly bad choices that I made as a young man uh, that led me to that, literally. At one point, sleeping in a social bank, or a social bank, bank teller uh, on... 17th Avenue, 14th Street in Calgary. And uh, when you hit rock bottom like that, it's a pretty dark spot. And luckily through that whole time, um, I had a couple of really close friends that did me some tough love. And my buddy, Corey, uh, who's still in Calgary today, very successful, um, literally bought me a plane ticket and said, you have to get Eddie and you have to go back to DEI. And that was literally my aha moment. Uh, 
last year. Actually, Corey and I went out for bike to eat when I was in Calgary for the CFA show, and uh, and we, we reminisced and talked about that. So that was, uh, I guess, some tough love, and, and luckily I had some people that were looking out for me would be my answer to that. Steve, I actually lived in Calgary, so I know it's a it's a very active city. The people that yeah. live there are very into fitness. So how did like how, where did health and fitness fall into this for you? Well, when I, when I came back to PEI uh, for a brief time, it was supposed to be for a brief time. You know, I I, I certainly wasn't a, a health junkie at the time. It was kind of later in life. It was my when my wife and I. We basically, in our 20s, said we should probably start leading a healthier lifestyle. I, myself, couldn't tie my shoes without getting out of breath. <laughs> so, third-degree training, the whole concept, again, with my with my wife and I, started as a personal journey. Uh, we tried other aspects of, of, of uh, you know, other classes and gyms and trainers, but nothing really spoke to us that uh, was, was really kind of open to everybody uh, without without being a specific market, or you had to be in shape to do this, or the whole, the whole thing with third degree training started with a, with a personal journey that, that eventually blossomed into a, a wonderful business. And why did you choose to franchise that business? Is it because it was such a, it's, a, it's such a big brand right now, and it's motive, like the concept is you know, so inspiring to people right now. Is that the reason why you kind of wanted to franchise well, it? Yeah, I think so. We at first, I mean, being back to the East Coast, there's only a handful of franchisors. Uh, the franchise industry itself in the East Coast has grown significantly, but at the time, I when when you say franchise, I literally had to Google it. You know, what I, mean? I if I could look back now, I mean, if I had to join the CFA uh, as soon as I was actually thinking about doing this, um, probably would have been uh, saved a lot of time. But what we wanted to do is we actually tried to expand corporately. We tried to open another location on the uh, the other end of the province, the other end of TDI. And we did okay with it. It's just that it, it took a lot of resource. So uh, what we looked at is we said, how can we find someone who loves this like we do? Mm-hmm. Who, 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 who loves the concept, loves the people, loves the whole system. And, and and have them own it and create an opportunity for them while being able to take our core values and our philosophy that has, 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 uh, has done so well and be able to have to expand it that way. So as I learned about the franchise model itself, I said, well, I think this is definitely the way to go, uh, 100% the way to go. And what was it about, when, after your Googling, what was it about the franchise model that appealed to you? Well, I looked at it, and, and I got some key advice back in the day from uh, a local franchisee, a uh, multi-unit franchisee here in PEI, and I, I kind of picked his brain, uh, ironically, I seen him at the gym, and I was talking to him, and I said, well, what made you buy an adult? And when he laid it out, he said, I don't have to get creative on the system, I execute the system. Uh, what a franchise, what they look for is, is brand value and also uh, a system that they can operate. So, I mean, the uh, uh, with, with looking on franchising and, and, and doing a little bit of research, the, the thing to come up with was what's the financial model? How do we ensure, ensure that our franchisees make money? Can we do that? All that kind of stuff. So it was almost a learn-as-you-go basis off the start. And uh, it just kind of went from there. And then I started to surround myself with, with experts in the field, with franchise lawyers, uh, the people who, who've been in the franchise field for, for quite some time, and I've learned a lot from them. So it's, it's one of these things where franchising, to, to some people, they automatically put a category of, like, like I said, uh, a major fast food or a major retail chain where there's so much more to it than that. But the, uh, there's lots of great information out there with, with uh, you know, why you should choose a franchise or what is franchising. The Canadian Franchise Association, is, that's kind of the the, uh, the pinnacle right there of where you can find that info. So tell us more specifically about the third degree concept and what sets it apart from other franchises in that sector. Absolutely. Well, with our model, it is it is quite different than, than the other ones. Our, our slogan is your body is your gym. So we, we focus mostly on plyometric style, which is body weight style, hit, hit style training. So when you look at if someone was looking at a potential uh, health and 
medical wellness franchise, why they would come to a third degree. Our startup cost is significantly lower. Our revenue cap is not is not uh, is, is, is quite high. So the whole thing with with uh, operating a third degree training, the initial investment, you don't have to spend hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars on equipment. But what we provide is the system, the expertise, the, the resources to make sure your center and your staff are operated the way that it's supposed to be. And um, with, with us, I, I guess the, the opportunity for expansion and for multi-unit, we have a first area development that is uh, sold in Halifax, and Jael now, she's actually operating two locations. And the, the, uh, when you look at the long-term effect of, of what we can do, your, your, your ROI, your return on investment is, is much more feasible as opposed to some other brands out there. What were the you know, unexpected challenges that you faced early on? Because I know you said you did your research and you listened to the experts and stuff like that. <laughs> there are still yeah, some things that are probably come that probably came up. I'm sure. Well, that's a great, great question, and it's funny because they, they still come up. The unexpected challenges as, as a franchisor is you got to remember you're dealing with people that are business owners. It's not employees. And you have to really be able to take an inventory of yourself and, 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 and know that fine line between how you would deal with an employee compared to how you would want to deal with a franchisee. I guess to look at it, you have to listen. And you have to listen to understand rather than listen to reply. Because these franchise owners that you're in, you know, you're, they're your franchise partners, they are your brand. Um, and in order for them to be happy and successful, you have to really be able to communicate well with these people. And, you know, when you get into the, the legal aspects, there's, there's certainly you have to align yourself with, with, uh, with professionals that know the ins and outs, uh, that you're doing things properly on the, on the back end mm-hmm. as well. And uh, the unexpected challenges that come up usually come back to uh, how you deal with the franchise. And as you get going uh, and franchising, you get some time under your belt like we had. You get you get better at it, and you realize that you know again you don't have to do everything yourself. You certainly can't micromanage your franchisees, and your job is to be there for them for the for them to become successful. And so, Steve, as I mentioned earlier, um, the health and fitness category is has seen significant growth over over a five year period. Um, it's one of our fastest growing uh, sectors, according to our Franchise Canada directory list listings. Mm-hmm. How do you account for this growth? Well, it's, it's, it's a booming industry. And you look at the traditional the traditional business model, you know, the 10, 15 years ago, it was usually a gym. You know, it was a gym, bricks and mortar gym with equipment and the odd program, you know, different flavors of, of programs. But what happened is, even since we started, uh, you see a big shift in that market where the, the one thing you got to remember is just like like a food industry. Everyone eats, and in the fitness and nutrition uh, business, most people want to be active, and most people want to to be healthy. So the biggest thing that our, our philosophy is: if people want to come and just do their own thing, they don't come to third. We lead by motivation, and it, it's a the whole shift in the industry. I think what happened is a lot of people with some great ideas and some great programming ideas. Have, have thrown that out there to say, does this speak to you? Mm-hmm. So if you're looking at uh, an industry, I think that it's just getting started. I, I don't, I wouldn't classify the saturation. I don't believe in that at all. I think that if uh, someone is going to walk into the doors to a third degree as a client or someone's going to look to be a franchise owner, if it really speaks to them, then, you know, the ball's in their court and the way they go. So the, the fitness business has evolved and changed and shifted to be more of a hands-on rather than just walk in the door, swipe a card and go do your thing and go home. There's a small percentage of people that that works for. So I would, I would say that that would be the biggest shift of, of, of really connecting with what people want and what inspires people and keeps people motivated. And from an investor's perspective, what, you know, what is, why is it a smart move to invest in a dues based business with recurring revenue? No, and that's a, that's a great question. And when you look at, when you look at statistics across the country, too, you, you define what, is, what does it mean to be a successful small business. And most times they'll look at it, you make it through the five years, you're doing great. The advantage to, to uh, uh, 
buying into a franchise system as opposed to going on it on your own is we've been there. We've actually done the ins and outs, made the mistakes, did, did the uh, examples of, of what you have to do to be successful. So it's not just a proven concept. It's the whole back end of the thing where you can walk into it and you execute the formula. As opposed to starting off and saying, scratching your head, saying, okay, well, how do I do this? What do I do? Uh, it's a lot of work. It takes a lot of time and a lot of resources to do that. So a franchise model, what's great about it is you are your own boss, but you're never on your own. Um, you have unlimited support, so you should have unlimited support from your franchise brand. And all those ins and outs of what should I do here or what can I do here or why will this work and will this work has already been done for you. How do you support your franchisees at the moment? Well, we we kind of pride ourselves in we are certainly not a 1-800 number that you call and say this is store 1856 yeah. <laughs> or whatever it may be. And it was not, nothing against a, a company that offers that, but we are very hands-on where when we say unlimited support, you know, I talk to my franchisees every day. So does my wife, Pam. So does our marketing and business development coordinator. We like to be hands-on, and if they have an issue, we want to help them resolve it. And uh, we'll always do that. And that's why we've had slow, organic growth. When we started to the East Coast Canada here. I wanted to be within an arm's length of, of all of our franchise partners so that I could manage that kind of stuff. And I, we certainly didn't want to have huge, explosive growth like some companies. But I find that, that it can get a little bit watered down. And uh, we, we are very, very tight with our franchise. And so what do you like, personally look at when you're uh, recruiting franchisee? What are the top qualities that kind of appeal to you? Well, you know, I've learned a lot over the years. <laughs> we call it profiling. And, and, you know, I don't like to use that word because it, it makes it seem like you have to plug someone into a horse on your computer. I'm not really, I don't really dive with that. I, I think that when you look at everyone has fantastic qualities and everyone has ways that they could be stronger mm-hmm. in, in certain areas. The number one thing is you have to love working with people. If, if, if not, if, if, you, if you're more of an introverted personality that prefers not to be on the front lines and working with people, then this is certainly not your business. Mm-hmm. Um, you also have to be or like to lead a healthy lifestyle. I mean, <laughs> you know, you're not going to have people coming in and, and uh, sitting there chugging back a soft drink and eating pizza and go get them tiger. That's not the way the way we go. So, But the biggest thing that we look for is grit. You, you have to have grit as a, as a franchise, as any entrepreneur, where you have to be willing to, to, to go that extra mile for long-term uh, success. While there's a, you know, there's a bit of a checklist that we have, the one thing that comes back to is that always you have to, you have to love working with people. You have to love inspiring people and you have to like to be inspired yourself. Can you share with us a specific franchisee success story that might give listeners better idea of what the ideal third degree franchisee looks like? Absolutely. Yeah. Let's, let's, uh, I could take, I'll take Jael or, or, uh, Halifax and Dartmouth franchises. Jael, um, she started working for us corporately. Where Jael had her own little company. Uh, she was, you know, trying to pick away in the industry that it's, it's tough to start on your own. So we had an ad out for a full time trainer that we wanted to have someone come in and join our team. Mm-hmm. So Jael came in to work with us and uh, fell in love with it. She was awesome. Like she's just a genuinely awesome person, not an ungenuine bone in that girl's body. So when she came in, she loved it. She worked it. She did great. And then the opportunity came up with uh, our Halifax franchise location. And with some heavy-duty thinking, uh, obviously she was going to have to move off island and to Halifax. But then she she pounced on the opportunity. And now Jael is operating two locations. She has, oh, two full-time employees, like the managers in each location. She has lots of part-time employees and has a lot of clients. And she's making a huge, huge impact in the Halifax market. With Halifax is literally Atlanta, Canada, Toronto. It's quite a large, hopping municipality. And she basically started from coming in, walking in the door, applying for a job, and worked her way up the ladder. And now she's a multi-unit franchise owner who's uh, living her dream. Wow. 
Yeah, it's pretty awesome. Pretty inspiring. Do you know like what's something that most franchisees like her might have underestimated about running the business? Absolutely. A lot of times, and I certainly don't want to classify anyone. It's not so much our franchisees, but a lot, a lot of, a lot of people in general. When it comes to operating a small business, you know, if, if you were to go uh, invest millions of dollars into a very high end restaurant or a gas station or something where people are just automatically going to pull in, you're paying a lot of money, and hopefully your your ROI is, is uh, significant on that. But when you're operating a, a business of of any caliber, it's the time. With our business, I mean, our, our 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 market is everyday people. It's literally people that work every day, that have kids, that have wives, that don't have four or five hours a day to exercise. Mm-hmm. So when we're operating a business, we're operating around your schedule. So the teaching the classes, doing the personal training sessions, the nutrition counseling, doing the sports teams, the corporates, all that kind of stuff is is, is fun, but you have to operate your business. So. The big thing is the time, and there has to be a balance that you, that you, that you find there because operating any business is not uh, nine to five, Monday to Friday. Mm-hmm. It's just it's just not feasible. And if you know, if someone nothing, not that there's anything wrong with that. Sometimes I'm actually envious of it, where I wish that maybe that's the way I took. Mm-hmm. But I'm just not built that way, and most entrepreneurs aren't built that way. So the, the big. Uh, the big misinterpretation sometimes is the amount of time that it takes to to operate your business. It, it certainly it can be overwhelming for some people if you're not planned for it. And so, like, how do you plan for it? How do you balance your your work and your life? Well, it's, it's funny. There, my my life used to be work. That was it until my son came. My son is three and a half years old oh. now, and uh, you want to throw a, a curveball into a busy lifestyle? Have children. And what happens is you have to find that balance. And it is very subjective to each individual. You have to have some downtime to be able to shut the brain off because you get to a point where if your wheels are spinning, you're just not getting it. Now, myself personally, I, I fell in love with philosophy and, and uh, religious studies, mm-hmm. studying all aspects of religions from around the world, studying philosophy. And I, uh, that's what keeps me kind of grounded where it works for me. Someone who's a little bit more pragmatic or scientific, they don't like the fact that, that there's no definite answer. But that, to me, keeps my mind wide open so that I don't always form the conclusion. And uh, it's very important that, that uh, I do that for myself and it's, it's uh, for my own mental health. You shared with us what, you know, what makes you move forward, but what are some lessons that you've learned from your franchisees in terms of how to be an entrepreneur, successful entrepreneur? No, that's a great question because no matter what, your franchisees look to you as a leader. And sometimes when you're at the top of the food chain, you look up and there's no one else there. So looking back down through the funnel, all of our franchise partners, every one of of our franchisees are extremely awesome in certain ways. Like they have amazing characteristics and they add a lot of value to our whole company. So, when it comes to certain things, they help me just as much as I help them. Where if they will question why we do things a certain way, uh, you can be very open to that and say, huh, maybe we're not doing this the right way. Mm-hmm. And being involved in the more franchisees we have in the mix, it seems to get better and better and better. So they've helped me a lot as how to be a leader instead of how to be a quote unquote boss. Mm-hmm. There's a big difference between the two. And forming a, a very respectable, communication-driven relationship, is uh, that's what helps me. And they, they help me as much as I help them. And so how do you set and reach your big goals? You know, you've started a huge company. And how do you continue to, to do that, to grow it? Yeah, and I mean, like I always say, um, we're just getting going. <laughs> we're, just, we're just getting going now. I like aggressive goals, but I like realistic goals. I don't necessarily look at goals as just financial. Uh, of course, financial has to be a, a, a part of it for reinvestment. But I don't try to do them on my own. I set a goal as a team, whether it be our corporate team or whether it be our franchise system. And I don't stop until I get them. And that's kind of that drive is kind of what keeps me going 
you know, like some people will say, okay, I have a 10 year plan. Uh, my philosophy, I, I don't believe in writing that stuff down. Uh, I think that when you set in concrete that your plan is to do X in, in one year and it's to do Y in five years, sometimes you're almost setting yourself up for limitations. I think that, that coming up with aggressive yet realistic goals, when I say aggressive, sometimes they could be unrealistic to some people, but I like that. I like that challenge. And uh, I think that the beautiful part of entrepreneurship is that I don't know any entrepreneurs. I don't know any that go, yeah, I'm good. You know, I'm good. Mm-hmm. I'm done. It, it's, that's the, the beautiful part of it. There's always, there's always expansion growth, whether it be adding new systems into your current system, whether it be opening uh, numerous locations, but making sure you're doing it for the right reason. Like I said, we, we started our, our franchise journey very organically. We wanted to do it properly to make sure that I didn't have explosive growth that could catastrophically kill our, our, our business model. What do, and what does uh, your system's growth look like in terms of the ideal location or city? That's a great question, too. As you know, we have a, a lot of irons in the fire for Central and West Coast development. And our model isn't geared towards just major cities. We're a very world driven business where our smallest franchise location is in a town of 2,100 people. So as we go and set across the, and that wasn't by accident. I mean, we don't, uh, I don't foresee uh, our franchise growth being on the main avenues of the major cities throughout Canada. We're a little bit more on the outskirts, where if you're looking at somewhere, well, let's just say Calgary. I have a soft spot for Calgary. We have some some development going to happen in Calgary. And we're not looking right down at Fifth Ave. You know, we like to be a little bit outside where the rent is a little bit more feasible for, for optimal profit. And... Uh, so you look at a, a province like, like Alberta, or you look at a province like Ontario with all the small rural settings. So you, a third degree training can literally go in pretty much any one of those, right? So that's our growth plan. Is there any consideration to the U.S. market? Oh, absolutely. I mean, when you're looking at the whole new ballgame, yeah. so what we, we want to make sure that when we get into that, we have the infrastructure in place. If someone came to me right now and said, okay, I want to open 55 locations in Throughout the United States, I think my knees would quiver a little bit because I would certainly need some help. So yeah. with the good thing about our, our, our system is when you look on a global app, people are people. You know, people want to lead a healthy lifestyle and they want to be led into, uh, into, that, into that lifestyle. And while creating opportunities for entrepreneurial-minded people, um, our, our, our concept is pretty much rock solid in, in any market. market. Thank you. So if you had one piece of advice to anyone looking to become a business owner, franchisee, like what would that be? I would say you're, you're definitely going to want to do your research. Look more beyond brand value. Besides the sign on the wall, you want to look at the support that you're going to get. Are they in the trenches with you? And when you're getting into a franchise partnership, it's, your, it's, it's like a marriage. I mean, I heard, I heard one speaker one time said, Getting out of a brand, bad franchise was was, e- or was uh, easier than getting out of a bad marriage. <laughs> yeah. It's one of those things where you want to do your research and make sure that the philosophy of the company that you're getting involved with really speaks to you. If it's just about money, I mean, you can always make money. There's, there's ways to make money, but getting into a franchise system, and you want to be involved with something that you're passionate about, that you're excited about, and then you can see yourself growing with the company. Um, over however many years you're looking to get involved with it. That's great advice. <laughs> What's next for you and your business, Steve? Well, we got a whack of stuff. We are looking now at uh, just just starting our cross country campaign. So, like I said, the first five years we kept it. Uh, first five years of our franchise, we kept it Atlanta, Canada, on purpose, just to make sure that uh, the wrinkles were ironed out and we were ready and we're good. So our plan now is to start our Cross Canada campaign. We are also expanding uh, locally. We have our, our, our actual nutrition food division, which we are looking to expand into numerous locations, uh, which will it's a standalone location, and that will probably hit the franchise market in a couple of years whenever it, it's uh, ready to go. We're also launching another wellness brand that will kind of, uh, I won't give away too much information, yeah, that's but that is a uh, fantastic uh, compliment. 
to our current uh, model that we have now. And uh, so going forward, we are actually in the process of we're going to be looking for a director of franchise development for the country, which is a very important role. And uh, we're looking forward to, to adding to our team. So it's going to be a really exciting few years for third degree training. Um, we're looking forward to, to uh, helping more, more entrepreneurs lead their dream and get involved with our franchise system. And uh, yeah, we're, we're pretty pumped. So, Steve, before we let you go, um, in our magazine, we have our franchise fun section where we get to know uh, franchisors a little bit on a, a little bit better. Can right. I throw some sentence starters your way? Oh, gosh. Yeah. <laughs> no. so He's not prepared. <laughs> the, the most interesting thing I've done recently is? The most interesting thing, and this is coming back to the philosophy of religious studies, I would have to say that I did a uh, lecture for the philosophy of wellness for the uh, philosophy and theology department at our local university. It's pretty fun. And the most important thing in life is? Family, 100%. One of the most enjoyable things to do is? Now, this is going to sound extremely cheesy, okay? <laughs> okay. <laughs> if you can wake up really early, go out, and gaze up at the early morning or evening stars. Um, it's a very humbling, mysterious experience that, that I recommend it for everybody. It's uh, there's it's one of those things that you have access to do it every day for free, and uh, I do it on a regular basis. That's not cheesy. That's beautiful. <laughs> oh well, thank you. Yeah. And what is the hardest thing for you to do? I would have to say it would be shut my mind off. If you could, uh, yeah, I'm sorry. No, 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 no. That was basically <laughs> it's one of those things where to be able to shut it down. My idea of relaxing is not sitting back and watching TV. Not that there's anything wrong with that. But no matter what, my mind is going to go. So it's, a, it's finding ways to shift it into uh, areas of other interests that, that can be relaxing rather than just uh, have the brain going 100 miles an hour. If you could change one thing? If I could change one thing, it would probably be studying philosophy uh, earlier in my life. It probably would have helped me a lot more earlier in my career. And if you could meet anyone, who would you meet? And th keep in mind, we've had some people come back with some fictional characters, so they don't <laughs> oh, have yeah, to be, no. <laughs> they don't have to be real. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'd have to say uh, it'd have to be Aristotle or Plato. And if it was more of a recent, recent person, it would have to be the late Christopher Hitchens. I was a big fan of his debates and uh, his his clever wit. And, uh, but those are the types of people that you can have some serious conversations mm -hmm. with. And Aristotle and Plato, you know, I mean, they're still, their, their lessons are still gone today. Who has had the biggest influence on you as a business person and entrepreneur? And that's a great question. I would have to say as basically just a working, a working entrepreneur, my father-in-law, he's a wonderful man. He's been operating his own strength fitting company for years. He taught me a lot of the values because, you know, basically, you don't always have to yak. You can lead by example. But there's been amazing people. Uh, uh, Ken LeBlanc from Property Guys. Um, as, as I said before, there's not too many franchisors down here in the East Coast. But Ken and Walter and his team, I mean, they're just, they're ultimate support. Um, like, I go over there to their office and they buy me lunch. You're like, you know? <laughs> And then another one, would have to be show, uh, throw a big shout out to Terry McNeil, who's now the president and CEO of, of the Canadian Franchise Association. When I first got involved with the CFA, I jumped into every resource that I could get. And one was the Mentor and Mentee Program. And Sherry is a, uh, she's helped me uh, through a lot. And she's really helped uh, so shape our business. And uh, so those three people would have to be the top of the food chain, uh, definitely. And my final one here, if you could just finish this sentence, Canadian franchising is just getting started. Uh, I think, uh, yeah, it's, Canadian franchising is, is, has a really bright future because there's some amazing brands and amazing people that are leading the way. And uh, it's, it's very exciting. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Steve, again. We are, it was a pleasure to have you on and uh, have a great day. Well, listen, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. And, uh, as you probably got from this podcast, like my wife says, it's not getting me to 
speak is telling me to shut up. It's a problem. <laughs> <laughs> that was awesome. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you, then. Have a great day. Bye now. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to the Franchise Canada's Experts podcast. For more, head to franchisecanada.cfa.ca.